Master, give the blessing. Wisdom. What you are about to listen to is a podcast produced by Philoclea Ministries. Philoclea Ministries is offered to all free of charge. However, there are real and immediate needs associated with it. If you are a regular listener or enjoy any of the content produced by Philoclea Ministries, we humbly ask that you consider becoming a contributor. You can learn more about our funding needs at www.philocleaministries.org. Please note that Philoclea Ministries is not a 401c3 nonprofit organization and that contributions are not tax deductible. Supporting Philoclea Ministries is just like supporting your other favorite podcasters and content creators, and all proceeds pay the production bills, make it possible for us to pay our content manager, and provide a living stipend for Father David. God bless you, and enjoy the podcast. Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory forever. Welcome back, everybody, to our study of the Ladder of Divine Ascent by St. John Climacus. And we are picking up with step number 27 on stillness, and we are coming to the end of it, uh, just another page or so before we segue into the step on prayer. And uh, the two obviously are intimately linked together, uh, but nonetheless, it'll be interesting to see how uh, John develops it. In fact, he starts this evening by talking about prayer specifically and how it's tied to the silent stillness. So again, page 230, number 68. Faith is the wing of prayer. Without it, my prayer will return again to my bosom. Faith is the unshaken firmness of the soul, unmoved by any adversity. A believer is not one who thinks that God can do everything, but one who believes that he will obtain all things. Faith is the agent of things unhoped for, and the thief proved this. The mother of faith is hardship and honest heart. The latter makes faith constant, and the former builds it up. Faith is the mother of Hezekist. For if he does not believe, how can he practice stillness? So an awful lot in this first paragraph for us to to think about and to pray about. But uh, simply at the beginning, faith is the wing of prayer. And without it, our prayer returns to ourself. That faith, our capacity to see beyond uh, the limits of uh, what is corporeal, of the natural world, to... Uh, comprehend that which is divine. This is the the source of our prayer and the wing of our prayer that lifts it up. And without it, uh, if our faith is lacking, then John tells us our prayer will return to us uh, bearing no fruit. And um, we don't often and perhaps as often talk about the theological virtues, faith, hope, and love. And one of, the, one of the reasons they're called theological is because they have God as their end. And so of the virtues, we should be praying for these particular gifts, these particular virtues, uh, uh, perhaps more than anything else, especially if they ultimately bring us to what it is that we desire. And so John tells us faith does exactly this. It brings our prayer to its, uh, the place where we desire to go, brings it to the, the heart of God. It's unshaken firmness of the soul, unmoved by any adversity. Uh, we've often talked about this, but it's good to hear John uh, say it explicitly, explicitly that uh, faith uh, is not shaken by the uh, vacillations of our time or history, the chaos of the age or the day, uh, or even the things that are much more personal to us, failure or illness, that uh, it again allows us to see through and see beyond these things 
uh, to what is really the source of our identity, where our, our real hope is to be found. A believer is not one who thinks that God can do everything. This is a, 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 a very important one, I think, in terms of our, our prayer life, because often it is our, our prayer, our prayer is a, a reflection of our hope that God would change certain realities in our day-to-day -day life and that he would take away certain crosses from us. Uh, whereas faith reveals to us that we will obtain all things in God. And so whatever cross we bear or whatever path that God uh, chooses to call us to walk in his providence should be embraced without uh, any fear or anxiety that uh, we hold uh, in the greatest confidence, the love of God, uh, to bring us to all things in him. And he will obtain all things. Faith is the agent of things unhoped for, and the thief proved this. So faith opens our eyes to see what we could not even begin to imagine for ourselves, very much like this thief. He knew his, his guilt uh, that his punishment was deserved, and yet faith allows him to cry out uh, to the Lord in his moment of, of desperation, to hope against hope, if you will. Uh, remember me in your kingdom, that it allows him to make this expression of faith that then brings him something that he could never have imagined hoping for, that he would come to experience the fullness of his desire that very day. The mother of faith is hardship and an honest heart. So the perfecting of faith comes through what we often will seek to avoid the most within our life, the hardship, the affliction that we often will experience. And when we get into uh, St. Isaac the Syrian, he moves into this very quickly within his writings, telling us that affliction is part of the spiritual life for us as men and women of faith, that there is a, a perfecting and a deepening of our faith that comes through it, and that without it, uh, and without this kind of testing, uh, our faith is never forged, as it were, in the fire. And so John is saying something similar here. The mother of faith is hardship that the hardship, the crosses that we experience in this life lead us to turn toward God and to cling to him uh, with, with greater strength. And he says, an honest heart. So uh, humility is also something that is necessary as well for the, the perfecting of this faith. You know, so long as we uh, hold on to the illusion that we are self-sufficient or that we can accomplish things in the spiritual life as well as in our uh, worldly pursuits outside of the grace of God. We are, are, we are uh, you know, we're never going to walk that path of faith. It's always going to be weak. And the moment that it is tested for us, again, when we experience failure, uh, then at times our faith will weak, weaken or disappear altogether. Uh, he, he tells us the latter, that is, an honest heart makes faith constant, and the former builds it up. So affliction strengthens it, uh, but our honesty of heart, our humility, allows it to, to be present within our hearts with a kind of constancy. So we never lose sight of our need for God. And so this always keeps our faith present and active within our life is the mother of Hezekist. So how without faith does a, an individual uh, remove himself from everything within the world, every worldly kind of consolation and no longer seeks within uh, the corporeal world for the fulfillment of his life or identity uh, and has really no great concern even for or fear for his body, but is driven simply by fear for his soul, for his soul's well-being. 
And so how is a hesychist who seeks to nourish himself uh, on prayer and on what God gives him uh, within that stillness? Uh, Isaac the Syrian says, uh, it begins to bubble up within us like the living waters when we enter into that stillness that what uh, the truths of God and the presence of God emerges for us in the stillness. How's a person to enter into this without faith? Uh, eventually they will, uh, I think, fall into a kind of despair or despondency, which John has told us many times is uh, the great danger for the hesychist. So faith, you know, as we are preparing to enter into our discussion of prayer and, and looking here, you know, at the final teachings on stillness that help uh, prepare the soil, if you will, for a deep prayer life, uh, we have to pray that God gives us the faith to, to remain in it and to allow it to be deepened in the ways that he describes. There's a lot there in paragraph 68. Anybody have any comments or thoughts about what John says? Number 69. He who is chained up in prison fears the judge who sentences him. But the hermit in his cell begets fear of the Lord. And the tribunal is not so terrifying to the former as the throne of the judge is to the latter. You need great fear for stillness, excellent man, because nothing else is so effective in dispelling despondency. The convict is continually looking to see when the judge will come to the prison. And the true worker wonders when the angel of death will come. A burden of sorrow fetters the former, but the fountain of tears binds the latter. So you need great fear for stillness. So this constant remembrance of death and judgment that we await that moment to see God face to face, but when we will also stand illumined, uh, where all that we've said and done will be present to, to all. And to live one's life in that reality gives rise, John tells us, to a fountain of tears that are cleansing. And uh, we've talked about this many times in the past. Fear of God is often uh, a stumbling block for individuals. Why, why is it so necessary? And part of it is how John describes it here for us. It focuses us in a particular way where we're able to direct our attention to what is above nature, what is beyond simply what we see with our eyes to that which endures to eternity. And, uh, but it also gives weight and significance uh, to our life. When we see our, our life in the light of Christ, then every action, every thought becomes freighted with destiny, filled with destiny. And so it, it leads us to, to look at our life through this, the lens of this relationship with God with a kind of constancy. Uh, eventually, you know, through the fountain of tears that John speaks of, uh, one would hope that that fear would give way to the purest of love, that one would be driven forward by desire for the Lord and uh, you know, the longing, the urgent longing to know the fullness of his love, where it's no longer fear of the judgment, but rather a longing for the beloved. Number seven. Bring out the staff of patience, and the dogs will soon stop their insolence. Patience is an unbroken labor of the soul, which is never shaken by deserved or undeserved blows. The patient man is a faultless worker who turns his faults into victory. 
So it's interesting, John brings in, into our discussion here, the virtue of patience. And it's, you know, John is always very colorful again in his description that he uh, describes it as if it were a, was a staff to drive away, you know, pesky dogs as it were. And similarly, uh, it uh, drives away insolence from us, uh, laziness or negligence in, in our life. And uh, uh, as well as help us uh, endure the blows that come to our ego in life. You know, the insults, the rebukes of others. And John says, whether they're deserved or undeserved, that patience allows us to, to make our way through them and allow them, to, again, to, to shape the mind and the heart to humble us where uh, they need to, or to, to deepen and solidify our faith. Patience is the limitation of suffering that is accepted day by day. So it's a beautiful way of putting it, the limitation of suffering that is accepted day by day. Uh, often we add to our suffering, uh, because of our lack of patience, when we're able to face certain things with a kind of holy resignation and be able to take up the, the cross of the day, then uh, we allow it to, to do its work and are strengthened uh, by that patience and the faith that allows us to do that. If we... Uh, are unable to embrace the day's suffering, then we begin to look forward with a fearful heart of not only our capacity to endure such things, but that God will provide us for the, the, the great, with the grace that is needed for the day at hand. The suffering of this day is enough to, for us to attend to, the scriptures tell us. So we, we aren't to be anxious about what we are to eat or what we are to wear, you know, that such things will be provided uh, through our, our labors, of course, but we are not meant to allow it uh, to become a source of distraction for us or make us pull our thoughts off of the moment, whereas patience allows us to do that. We serve the providence of God in the uh, sometimes the the harshness of day to day life, or the harshness of a particular moment, and when we can say yes and bear that, then we make our way through it, and uh, and we make our way through it grac graciously, and are able to move forward again, having greater and greater trust in God as as we do so. I think this is part of the reason they all, the fathers always tell us not to be complainers either. You know, complainers don't have patience. They're always griping about this or, or, or that thing and how hard it is or how miserable it's making their life. And so it keeps them from living. Whereas if, if we're able to sort of take hold of the day and even its hardships, recognizing that God is present in them, and to do so with a kind of maintaining that stillness of heart and that prayerfulness, then those moments can be for us every bit as fruitful as any other that seem pleasurable to us or that seem to be fruitful in some ways, in some fashion, in some, in some ways even more fruitful for us. Anthony writes, there's a tension though between a situation that is wrong, which should be made right, and waiting in patience. Uh, right, that, you know, justice is, you know, something that love demands. And so if we see an evil that is being done to another, you know, of course, we do not sit on our hands and do nothing as we see another suffering. But I think in the warp and woof of day-to-day -day life, you know, in the moment, you know, there are thousands of moments throughout the course of the day where we are given this opportunity to say yes to God or no to him. 
to take hold of the grace to embrace the moment or to let that moment pass us by. And that can be simply maintaining the stillness that John is talking about here so that there is this constant remembrance of God, that we are able to face the things that come to us with patience, move through them, see the presence of God in them and not be distracted. And I think more often than not, we become agitated by one thing after another and we lose that patience. And so then we lose that stillness of heart as well as the capacity to pray. And, you know, I, th I think the model for us, the standard for us always <laughs> is Christ himself. Uh, you know, the, the one who, you know, suffers so many indignities beyond, I think, our grasp, uh, you know, from the humbling of himself in the incarnation, but the rejection of his own people, uh, the indignities that he suffered. But, you know, even to uh, the patience that God himself shows us, uh, that loved so fully without condition, given so much compassion, and yet we make so many different things in our life idols that we give our attention to. We forget God in the moment. We become impatient with our life and the circumstances, and so we gripe against him and we get tired of waiting. We're, we're, we're like the Israelites. You know, we, we build our own idols out of gold because we're tired of waiting for Moses up on, on the mountain. And uh, the next thing, you know, we, we're turning away from God. And we do this in, you know, thousands of little ways, not only great ways. And sometimes it's uh, simply in turning our thoughts away from the Lord. Okay, so like Abraham had a promise that took a long time to realize. Yes, and uh, the, but the, the promise that has been given to us is far greater. And the, the grace that has been given to us already is uh, something that allows us to experience that reality in the here and now. Uh, <clears throat> that we are made sons and daughters of God, heirs of the kingdom, that we are given the grace of God to love as he loves, to be merciful as he is merciful. We are nourished upon it within the Eucharist. And so our level of patience should match uh, what it is that we are given from moment to moment, the spirit that dwells within us as well as the body, blood, soul, and divinity of the Lord that we receive in the, the Holy Eucharist. What patience should this reality produce within, within the heart? You know, I think there's a part of us that shrinks back and revolt because we can always come up with so many examples in our day-to-day -day life that give rise to that impatience where we want to let a person have it or throw up our hands and say, I've had enough, I'm done. And the, the gospel and the fathers don't allow us the, the ease of, of doing that. Let's see, where did I leave off? Patience lays aside all excuses and all attention to herself. And so this comes back to what we were just talking about that there is always going to be something within us that wants to free us from the charge of the gospel, free us from the charge to love as Christ loves. And so John tells us it sets aside all of these excuses, no matter how reasonable they might seem in our minds, that what we are called to is the perfect patience of Christ. The worker needs patience more than his food because the one brings him a crown while the other may bring him ruin. So the worker, if you, if you see in the footnote there, number 18, is the hesychist. 
So the hesychus needs patience uh, more than his food, that he needs not to become impatient in the stillness and in the silence, not to doubt that God is going to nourish him or draw him to himself. And uh, he needs this kind of patience more than he needs food. And so if he seek, seeks to uh, satisfy himself uh, on an emotional level, on a physical level, uh, by being overly attentive or concerned about the next meal, then he's already stepped away from his primary vocation, which is to allow himself to be nourished upon God and nourished upon this silence and the stillness itself. Father Marty writes, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers, 1 Peter 4, 7, right? Self-controlled and sober-minded. So clear-headed and understanding our, our vocation, uh, and but also control that we aren't uh, tossed about uh, upon the, the waves of day-to-day of -day life. The patient man has died long before he is placed in the tomb, having made his cell his tomb. So the hesychist has already uh, said, as it were, goodbye to the world, that his focus is upon the Lord and seeking him in the stillness and the silence. He's made his cell the place where he's going to remain and not seek for life outside of what God has called him to, him to. That there is nothing greater for him in his mind than what he could find in his cell. And there, there is a kind of, what do they call it, wanderlust that is in us at times where we want to, you know, go to different places, see different things, thinking that we will be enriched by the, the experience, our life will, will be enriched by it. And so we're driven here and there. And, uh, and the hesychus can be the same. You know, he can lose faith that staying uh, in his cell and engaging in this, this still, engaging God in this stillness is the, the richest and most life-giving thing that he could do. And often we, we have a similar problem, you know, of staying within the mind and the heart and focused upon God, that we redirect our attention elsewhere. And so we're flitting about, whether it's in our minds or from person to person or travel, traveling from place to place. And so the Hesychus becomes really a powerful model for us, not only of patience, but of stability, of remaining in the moment, in the place where God has placed us, trusting that there's providence in that. Hope engenders patience, and so does mourning. And he who has neither is slave to despondency. So if one doesn't have hope, then the patience that is necessary to stay within the cell will disappear, or it will seem as though it offers nothing. And if one does not mourn over one's sin, one loses the, the motivation, again, to stay within that cell and to be attentive to the internal life. And, and so when one loses both of these things, that are such profound sources of, of motivation for us, the next step is despondency, the kind of spiritual sadness, boredom, lack of trust that the spiritual path is going to bear fruit for us. Jolie's iPad. It's hard when you're accused of something you didn't do or say not to defend yourself. Absolutely. And, uh, but that's probably the most fruitful thing for us. Again, in terms of perfecting our faith, perfecting our patience and humility. If to be accused of something that one did not do, 
uh, and not to, to jump up immediately to defend our integrity in the eyes of others. And you've probably remembered the stories from the Evergatinos of monks taking upon themselves the blame or the punishment. John gives a couple examples of this as well, that one will take upon the penance and the punishment uh, due to a, another uh, a monk uh, or because he was falsely accused. And only later uh, will the truth you know, come forward. Sometimes the monk is kicked out of the monastery. Uh, because of the accu accusations. And, uh, and so again, you know, Christ for us is always the standard and the model. Who is more innocent? Who could uh, claim innocence more than Christ and yet did not defend himself, did not say a word of defense upon his behalf, even when being mocked upon the cross itself? Okay, number 71, Christ warrior should know what foes to parry from a distance and which to fight at close quarters. So this is an interesting little teaching that when we engage in spiritual warfare and we see a kind of demonic provocation or something that potentially could lead us into sin or become a distraction for us. There are certain ones that we have to be aggressive with in the sense of striking them down immediately. And there are others that we uh, seek to distance ourselves from them as much as we can uh, to flee from them. That a smart warrior is going to know uh, that the enemy he's going up against is one that by his prayer, fasting, vigils, he can overcome. Or if there is uh, an enemy that's strong, he's going to keep his distance and simply, you know, remain in, si in the silence of his prayer and, and stay connect as connected to God as he possibly can. That there are certain, and even in terms of, you know, living in, in the world, you know, uh, St. Philip Neri, I've mentioned, said uh, in this struggle uh, for purity and the struggle against lust, the coward is the victor. That this is you know, the one who flees, he said, the one who runs away from circumstances uh, that could put him to the test. And that would be a similar thing would be true for, for the hesychist, that he would, would not want to, to put himself in an occasion where perhaps he would be overcome by despondency or by anger for some reason. Uh, and so he would stay close to the cell, you know, in his work, he would, you know, keep his focus upon that, not what others are doing and so, so forth so on and so forth. Sometimes the combat has earned a crown. Sometimes refusal has made men reprobate. So, you know, our, sometimes our willingness to engage in a battle, even when the, the threat to us seems so great, uh, and yet we enter into it with this trust in God and fight with all of our strength. It, it can win a crown. But if we show a lack of courage and a lack of fidelity, then it can make us reprobate in the eyes of God. That we did not even make an effort. We simply succumb to the temptation uh, when, it come, when it comes to us. Remember always that image, nobody likes to go up against a plucky fighter. And so we want to be courageous in the battle, uh, knowing again who it is that fights with us and how, wh what weapons we've been given. Sometimes, I'm sorry, 
the next sentence. It is not feasible to lay down precepts in such matters, for we do not all have the same character or dispositions. So John doesn't go further in, than what he said here uh, in, in regards to engaging fiercely in that battle and in the combat, uh, because he knows that everybody has a different character, character disposition, uh, you know, natural weaknesses, flaws, as, as well as passions that they struggle with. And so he's not going to become over detailed about it, which is a good thing. I think that should remain between one's spiritual father or mother and, and uh, you know, being able to talk through the particular temptations and battles that one faces on a given day. We can't approach, even having something like this called the ladder, we have to be very careful about it because it's not setting up something programmatic for us. The fathers through their ascetic life were able to reveal common struggles that we have internally and how we wage the battle against them. But not every person is the same. And so we can't come up with an overly programmatic spiritual uh, role or discipline for every, you know, for every person to follow it, that's to ignore the uniqueness of the individual. And that can be a big temptation in, in our day or in the popularization of spirituality or, or religion itself, to, to want to synthesize things in order that it can be understood and embraced by all. And that goes sort of contrary to our understanding of the human person. Each person is a mystery and, and has to be treated in that way, that everybody has their unique experiences, crosses, weaknesses, strengths, sorrows that they've, they've experienced. And so whoever is a spiritual father or mother has to be attentive to those things so that you're not just putting something indiscriminately before another. Uh, as something to take up in an unmeasured or, or, or in a thoughtless fashion. So we don't want to overly literalize this image of the ladder for ourselves. You know, in reality, we're, we're fighting with all these things throughout the whole of our life. And we're seeking to deepen and perfect our virtue, our prayer, but always to, to overcome our attachment to the things of the world or the things that lead us to sin. So it's interesting, you know, the fathers had a, you know, a pretty profound personalism there. You know, they knew the, the uniqueness of the individual person and that, that had to be respected. It's number 72. There is one spirit on which you should keep a vigilant eye. He is the one who assails you unceasingly during your standing, walking, sitting, movement, rising, prayer, and sleep. Now, in, in general, one might say that this is simply the evil one, that he's unresting, that whatever it is that we might be doing, or saying, or even when we're sleeping, we have to be vigilant uh, uh, about this, this one. But uh, I think we could all also interpret it as our self, as our ego, that we've often talked about this, that there is a kind of almost muscle memory with our ego. It snaps back into place and wants to, to be the center of reality for us. We want to make ourselves the center, even of the spiritual life. And so we take ourselves into all of these different circumstances, standing, walking, sitting, any movement, rising prayer, sleep. It's us. And we have to be vigilant because we can betray our own selves uh, and do the very things that we hate uh, and have set ourselves against. And so we have to be vigilant against the evil one, but we also have to 
be vigilant against uh, the, the fault. Uh, Anthony writes in his note there, ego is the false self. And uh, is despondency a false remorse? I think so. Uh, or it's rooted in the false self that is not being fulfilled or thinks that it's not being fulfilled by the life that God has uh, led one to embrace. And so this deep sadness begins to emerge. But, you know, ego then gives, you know, rise to vain glory, pride. These are always the things that bring us down so swiftly, no matter what the circumstances might be. Number 73, not all loaves of the heavenly wheat of this spiritual food have the same appearance. On the course of stillness, the preeminent uh, ever practice, I'm sorry, the preeminent ever practice the following activity within themselves. I beheld the Lord ever before me, but others in your patience possess ye your souls. Some watch and pray, others prepare thy works for thy death. Some, I was brought low and he saved me. Some, the sufferings of the present time are not worthy to be compared with the future glory. And others always have in mind the words, lest he snatch you away and there be none to deliver you. For all run, but one receives the prize without effort. So interesting, those are all wonderful reasons to run uh, uh, that are set before us here. The one example after another that John gives us, uh, but, for, uh, but one receives the prize without effort. And I think that one is the humble individual. He who humbles himself will be exalted. He who recognizes on a fundamental level that Christ is Lord and places all of his or her trust in him. And uh, it is then that, again that we are lifted up. Without effort, yes, because it's, uh, uh, Carol Nypaper writes uh, that it's a good question because it is letting go of control or it's letting go of an illusion. It's entrusting ourselves uh, to the Lord, but it's simply truthful living. It's li living in the truth. So it's not uh, this profound asceticism or renunciation. It's simply acknowledging the truth about who we are and who Christ is to us. And so that's why Christ says, he who humbles himself will be exalted. If we humble ourselves, we will be, it will be like uh, a parent lifting up their child to look at them face to face. The child has no effort makes no effort in that engagement. Okay, any other questions? Yes, Kate writes, I'm really blown away by the simplicity of this. How many times have I complicated the spiritual life? Yes, uh, I couldn't agree with you more. And I think about that you know, almost every day about how complicated we we make the faith, religiosity, we make our own lives, how complicated we make our relationships with others, and how complicated we make our turning to the Lord, our simply remembering him from moment to moment. You know, one of the things that always annoyed me in grad school and even in studying theology is that you'd read these books and it's almost like the authors purposely make them incomprehensible. Uh, I think I've mentioned this before. The one writer that was big when I was in seminary was Hans Urs von Balthasar. 
and his the original writing that he or original language he wrote in was German. Uh, but so you'd have these like uh, paragraph long sentences. And you, you know, you'd go round in circles and you'd have to read like 300 pages and then you'd get to a paragraph where you'd say, aha, okay, I get what he's saying. And, and he was held up as this figure of, of brilliance. And he was, he had this, you know, almost photographic memory, this extraordinary knowledge of spirituality and theology, and he could synthesize it all. But uh, who, who were to keep our eyes on is Christ, who lays before us this simple path. In fact, he is the path. It is in loving him and having faith in him that we are, are brought to the kingdom. And we, we often make it comp complicated. You know, even in talking to God ourselves, what, what am I supposed to do with my life? And it's this agonizing question and we turn that into, we morph it into our relationship with God. And so what we do, we, we convince ourselves that this is the will and the providence of God. And so we take upon these things that crush us and crush our lives, make them ever so complicated, fill us with anxiety and fear when what alone is necessary is this simple life and love and trust in the Lord. And we seek our identity, our dignity, our purpose, and what we have, what we achieve, what we can say or what we can teach, all these different things uh, that use so much time and energy that often have nothing to do with the gospel or the church at all. You know, the things that the church produces, these high color, these you know, vibrant color, glossy booklets that they send out and, you know, one document after another that nobody reads. What we need is this simple evangelization, the gospel. And what we need is saints who are living it. And we're talking about it incessantly. And, you know, I've talked about this before, you know, the whole seminary experience is sort of along those lines you know you're being prepared professionally to carry out a role and i'm sorry you know it's if they want to prepare you better professionally they'd, they'd be better off teaching you how to be a plumber and electrician and how to do finances you'd do a heck of a lot better in a parish and serve your parish better if you had knowledge of those few things uh, and save a lot of money in the process, but uh, uh, I want to turn to one of the comments here because uh, uh, David writes, I wasted years reading books and talking to people on discernment, which always was a labyrinth of paths. On a retreat, an old Jesuit priest made it easy in one minute. Does this lead me closer to God or away from God? Our intellect often gets us lost and like a rocking chair giving us some, something to do, but going nowhere, right? Beautifully put. And somebody put bullseye, and I would agree with that, uh, because I, th I think it's true. The time, the energy, the anxiety that goes into things that we think that we need to live a life that is pleasing on, when it takes an instant, a fraction of a moment, you know, to turn the mind and the heart to God in love. Uh, you remember the, I've mentioned the Cloud of Unknowing, a great book to read by one of the English mystics. And that's what he said. He said, it takes, you know, in his, he puts it in this kind of scientific language of his own day. He said, an, an atom of a moment. So he says, the smallest fraction of a moment is all it takes to turn the mind and the heart to God in love. And so to say Jesus, to say God in an instant brings us to where we need to be. And one does not have to have a doctorate to understand that. In fact, our cleverness gets in our way, you know, because we, we make up new ways for ourselves to think about how, you know, the church can be renewed 
or what we need to do to renew the church. Well, the way the church is renewed is by people loving Christ and giving themselves over to him. It's renewed from within and it's renewed from within our own hearts. It's not by coming up with a, a new program for parishes and, you know, nothing like that at all. And so the gospel, you know, we often laugh here about only needing a couple of books, the scripture, the latter, and a, a few others. And it, again, that's, it's true. I mean, for the fathers, their nourishment was the scriptures. That was their spiritual reading. And these desert monks didn't have, you know, degrees. Well, some of them did, but it's not as though that they, you know, that degree was going to do them any good living in a cave in the desert. You know, they, they understood that pretty quickly. And uh, there was a sister that worked, that I worked with for many years, and she was probably 30 years my elder. And she said, you know, we spend the first 30, first 30 or 40 years of our life collecting things, and the last 30 or 40 seeking to get rid of them before we die. And again, she's right, right on the money. You know, we're desperately seeking after things to elevate ourselves or to improve our lives where we have him within our own hearts. A couple of comments here. Anthony writes, or Susanna writes, there is a proverb in Islam. There are as many ways to God as there are breaths in his creature. Right. And Anthony writes, for your information, it was college professors and lawyers who from late scholasticism through Reformation and the spirit of Vatican II caused us so many problems. <laughs> oh, oh, Anthony, you're, you're always causing trouble. Uh, well, it's funny, you know, it's, you know, people will use this term Jesuitical and, you know, I don't want to be mean to Jesuits, but it's become like, uh, it has negative connotations, which is to sort of twist things up, complicate things, or, you know, uh, to be sort of conniving in some way. And we can approach the faith life in, in that way, ca calculating, you know, that we're in our cleverness, calculating this path to others. And what it makes us is hucksters of religion, of the faith. You know, we start selling something that we don't believe ourselves and that ha hasn't had any impact upon us at all. You know, ask yourself how many priests out there know depression or anxiety or struggle with their faith, or know deep isolation. Because, you know, being a priest isn't about having a degree or being able to give a great homily. It's about know knowing Christ and serving his flock. And, you know, those things you don't learn from books. Same thing with prayer. And it's interesting, John will say that in his step on prayer, you know, all, all of this, you don't learn from books. You learn by praying. That's how, how you learn how to pray. So where do I leave off here? Okay, number 74, I believe. Uh, did I miss any here? Okay, number 74. He who makes progress works not only when awake, but when asleep as well. So even in their dreams, some snub the demons who approach them by admonishing uh, dissolute women concerning chastity. But do not expect visits and do not prepare for them beforehand because the state of stillness is perfectly simple and free. So the more one is transformed in this stillness, the simpler that one's focus becomes on, on Christ, 
then it begins that relationship and the grace of it permeates every fire of our being, whether we're awake or asleep, which is a comforting thought that the more that we've in interiorized this love for the Lord and this remember, remembrance of the Lord and the desire to please him, then even in our sleep, our minds are set upon him. So much so that John says that some of these individuals will be fighting off temptations that emerge on an unconscious level when they're sleeping. That's an extraordinary thing to wake up praying with prayers on your lips or to have something like that take place. It's almost like a person who begins to dream in a foreign language that they're studying, you know, and that's often a big moment for them because then it says the study of that language has really permeated on a deep level. They're thinking, you know, in that way. And, you know, for one who has learned this language of love, of humility, of self-sacrifice, that it per permeates us so deeply that uh, it touches the unconscious. And we begin to see signs of that, you know, that what would come forward in our dreams or, uh, you know, even praying, you know, when we were first aw uh, awake in the, in the morning. Uh, no one intending to build a tower and cell of stillness will approach this work without first sitting down and counting the cost. And he will feel his way by prayer, considering whether he has within him the necessary means of completing it, so that he should not lay the foundation and then become the laughingstock of his enemies and an obstacle to other workers. So, you know, for the hesychist, the counting the cost is, you know, uh, looking to see if one has engaged in the spiritual battle for purity of heart. One has overcome the passions, but also that one has engaged and fostered this unceasing prayer and simplicity that we've been talking about. So one has to sit down before entering into the life of the hesychist in other words, into this radical kind of stillness of the hermit, that to enter into that without this kind of purity of heart and humility, one is destined to, to fail at it and have to return to the monastery. Uh, and so we have to think you know, well about how we are living our life. And for all of us living in the world, you know, I think, Similarly, before we open our mouth and speak about things of the faith or engage others, you know, we, we have to look deeply and to ask ourselves, do we love Christ? Do we pray? You know, is, is our, are our minds and our hearts set upon him or are very much on things of this world? Number 75. I'm sorry, number um, 76. Examine the sweetness you feel in your soul, lest it be compounded craftily by cruel physicians, or rather treacherous ones. So examine even the sweetness that you feel in your soul, the consolation that you might experience at a given moment in times of prayer. Uh, because across the board, the, the fathers tell us is that what we want to cling to when we do and are given con experience consolations or are given uh, consolations by God is that we cling to the faith that they produce. So if we experience a kind of sweetness in our prayer, we allow it to lead us forward in deeper measure into that prayer to stay focused upon Christ. If we become focused upon the sweetness of it and become enamored with that and want to reproduce it is when we can be led astray. And this is what John is saying here, that we can be guided by those who use this in a crafty way. And he describes them as cruel physicians 
and treacherous one. So they make use of these consolations or the sweetness of the spiritual life or the life of virtue to get us to over-focus upon them and to make them an end in themselves rather than to thank God for them and to continue along the path that he's called us to. And in our day and age, when there is a lot of attention that is given to experience or the affective level of the spiritual life, uh, of, of having consolations or wanting them in the spiritual life, this is a very important teaching that they do come to us and God undoubtedly does stir the flame of desire within us by giving us consolation, certain sweetness uh, at times when needed, but do not cling to them as an end in themselves. So we can be thankful and grateful, but don't open ourselves to this kind of deceit. So that brings us to, surprisingly, 830. There's so much in these sayings to meditate upon. And so always good to go back and reflect upon them. The same will be true on the step on prayer. Absolutely beautiful, but we, we don't want to rush it. So we might only have one or two steps left, but it's probably going to take us six months to make our way through it. So, okay, folks, any final comments, questions? Again, we're, we are moving on to the ascetical homilies of Isaac after this. So you want to uh, make sure you get a copy of that. And maybe in the next email that goes out, we'll put a link to the publisher where, where you can get it. Okay. And the monks, by the way, sent a heartfelt thank you to everyone who donated a book they were ecstatic about it and now that they can have a copy in front of them as we're, we're going through it so thank you on on their behalf thank you so much for your generosity to them ever so grateful so when we close as as always with the our father in the name of the father the son and the holy spirit amen our father who amen. art in heaven hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. The Lord be with you. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. God bless everybody.